I really thought the spirit of the Open Medicine Foundation is the spirit we're trying to embody as, as an organization, as investigators, this concept that, that we need to work with speed, that we can't hold our stuff so close to the chest that time goes by before it can be moved into uh, actual clinical practices. And sometimes, you know, people will sit on their data for years while they get all their publications and whatnot, and that's just not helping. You know, we, this is a, there's too few of us in the field to be getting too, too uh, much about the ownership of, of what we got. But instead, you can say, in my career, I made a difference. And that's what we do this for, right? This is it. This is exactly why we are here. So a little less uh, money, a little more, damn, I did something important with my life. And that's, that's what, what, this, um, what I'd like to hope that this session is going to promote. So I'm going to ask Linda to come up. Well, while everybody's coming up, thank you. Thank you very much, Nancy, and, and thank you for inviting me for the one session that is my biggest passion as well, which is collaboration. So I'm Linda Tannenbaum, and I'm from the Me Open Medicine Foundation, and uh, our mission and my passion is for collaborative medical research and education for MECFS and chronic complex illnesses. And you all know that collaboration is really the only way we can not only solve this, but fast track it, because we, we just don't have time. We need to do this as quick as possible. So we need to collaborate, we need to be open. We're called Open Medicine Foundation. Our results are gonna be open. In fact, this week we're launching our website that if you go to our website, openmedicinefoundation.org, it'll have researchers on the right-hand side. And we're opening up our clinical results of our severely ill patient study uh, to be uh, able for researchers to come on and sign on and download the raw data, take a look at the raw data, and please continue research with whatever you see. And we will put up results as they come up. Um, we're about halfway through our, our big study, and as results come up, we'll be putting them up there. So we'll have a table um, uh, throughout the week for researchers to sign up so we can uh, send you the link to, uh, to register, and it will be open on our website in about three weeks. So thank you very, very much. Um, I'd like to um, begin uh, this session uh, with uh, the person who I am uh, very, very proud to uh, introduce, which uh, most of you know, which is uh, our OMF uh, Scientific Advisory Board Director, Ron Davis. He's the director of the Stanford Genome Technology Center, professor of biochemistry and genetics at Stanford, and I am proud and pleased to introduce Ron Davis. Well, first of all, I'd like to take this as an opportunity to thank Nancy. Uh, I think you've done a great job putting this together, and it's been great for the scientific community and great for the patients. So thank you very much. Well, I, I, I'm a big proponent, as, as Nancy said. We, we really need to try to work together as a community and, and get the put together the infrastructure that would make it easy to do. So um, I have several examples I just would like to share with you. Um, I worked on a big trauma project at one point. Uh, we were finding results in that trauma study that the theories of the tra that were present about trauma were all wrong. Uh, and a lot of uh, physicians and researchers didn't like it. Um, and so, we did studies that took like three months to, to do the study and took us two years to get it published, going through multiple rejections. Uh, none of them actually valid reasons to reject it. It just, they didn't like it. They think it must be wrong. Uh, that just, it was a big impediment. And uh, I'm not very happy with the review process today. Uh, I only get about one review every 10 years that actually helps the paper. <laughs> oh, I didn't even think of that. That's great. Let's put that in there. All the others are crap. And as far as I can tell, people who get reviews send them to their first year graduate students and the first year graduate student has to come up with some criticism and some suggested for some additional experimentation to show that they read the paper. 
And of course, that becomes the review. And it's useless, absolutely useless. And it's, people have to understand if you reject a paper and say, you have to do these new experiments. You've already gotten to the limit of the page limit for the publication. You also, therefore, have to take something out. So you can't suggest a new experiment until you say what also needs to be removed from the paper. And the problem with that is that you have to go, you have to do the experiments and you have to remove something. And inevitably remove things in the paper that are absolutely critical for the paper. And we have no choice. And in fact, there are sometimes big distortions in the scientific literature because of that. It's a lousy process. These, almost always these new experiments are the next experiment. They don't need to go in this paper, they go in the next experiment in publication. Anyway, uh, that's my uh, problem with this. Uh, I know everybody likes to go to the high exposure journals, but they don't do a very good job. And the review processes are awful for those high exposure journals. They're, they're as far as I'm concerned, totally incompetent. Um, but unfortunately, we're stuck with them and, we lo and, and your promotions and everything else and your jobs are dependent upon getting. And some, some places say, well, we won't, we won't hire anybody unless they have a nature publication. This is ridiculous. Read what they've done and figure it out. Don't use the journal and the editorial systems to do that. <clears throat> so I, th I think we could do a better job if we could work together better. And this whole business of waiting for it to be published and so forth, can't we speed up the process? And, and one way is to share a lot more. We can go to meetings like this, but uh, there ought to be other ways to do that where we can share our data. And so what we're, we're going to try to set up something uh, in the process of putting it together, which will be a website, which will have all our data on it before it's published. And everybody's free to look at it, and everybody's free to use it. What we would ask them is they not take it and publish it. And, and I, I, uh, I got into this uh, when we were doing uh, uh, genome sequencing. I, I, I've done DNA sequencing for 20 years. And uh, early on in the human genome sequencing, uh, we actually proposed this and got really dinged for it in our review, was that we would post the data from our sequence every day. So we would, re we would release our data that we collected within 24 hours on a website that everybody could see. Initially, people said that would be a disaster. You would, you would have errors in the sequence, yeah. But most of it's right. <laughs> and finally, that became a rule. So if you had a big sequencing grant, you had to release your data within 24 hours, which meant we had to let the community look at it before we did, because we were busy doing the next sequencing. <laughs> and we weren't having time to go look at the sequence. I, that did not harm us that much. Occasionally, people took the data and published it, but it was rare because I understood that was really unethical. And I think with the same standard could be applied, it would really speed things up. And that, that was part of the reason that the Genome Project had such a big effect, because you weren't waiting two or three years for them to see, finish something. It was already in the websites. Another uh, illustration of this, I, for many years, I worked on uh, baker's yeast. Initially, when I started with that, it was an obscure field with some genetics doing tetra dissections, and that's all they did. And uh, I and a few people tried to bring in new technology to work on yeast, and and we did a, it was it worked extremely well. And in fact, yeast became the model system for everything else because we could do it faster on yeast than anybody else could do it, and so we would always be able to develop the new tools and show that they were working. The general rule in that yeast field, and that part of it is that it, I think it appeared to the people working in yeast, nobody cares about yeast except the yeast workers. Well, nobody cares about chronic fatigue syndrome except the chronic fatigue syndrome research. We're not any different than what we like it with yeast in the years past. And we became together as a community. And we told everybody what we were doing. And if we found a mutant that was incredibly useful for something, we gave it away before it was published. And in fact, it, it was more than that. We realized, oh, this researcher really needs it. We'll send it to them and tell them what it is. And, and of course, then they come back in with a letter. This is before the, uh, the internet. That, wow, that's great. That'll help us tremendously. 
So everybody was trying to help everybody else out in their research. That's what made it go so fast. And it, was, and it also made it a lot of fun because you're facing the problem of how do you solve the science problems, not how do I kill my enemy. And that isn't actually any fun. And, you, and the problem, scientific problem itself is enough of a challenge. And then you try to take care of everybody. So you worry about someone who's looking for a job. What, uh, what can we do to help them get that job? And the whole community would jump, come in to do that and write letters of support and talk to them and try to help them. So it was really just a whole community and I think that would be what I would love to see happen. Now we have better technology. So uh, I don't know exactly how to do it and we're just gonna try it ourselves for an experiment but I would like to see if we can't somehow do this that would help everybody out in the research. And, and the other thing to keep in mind is a negative result is a result. You can't publish it, but it's a result. <laughs> and, and, and our scientific standards have got a real problem because you can't publish negative results. But tell, that often tells you something. And in fact, if 10 people do the same thing and get a negative result, it's probably real. But you get, nobody can publish it, so more people keep doing it. And I, I also worry about the, the impacts of, of not being able to publish negative results. And there's an example in yeast. In the case of yeast, you think about when, you are, when the cell is growing um, and it's exposed to something like a new food, that it will induce the genes that allow you to use that food. That's the classic model from bacteria. And there's examples of that in yeast. But as we worked in yeast, we found that that generally wasn't true. We would do an experiment, and here's a condition where that yeast it needs that gene. Oh, it must be induced now. No, it wasn't induced. So we put that in the paper. And the reviewer said, that's not a result. You have to take it out. And so we would. And that happened across the board. So when you think of yeast and, and you uh, talking about it in, in like class, you think that when a gene is needed, it's induced. That's by far the exception. There's only like six or seven genes that do that. The other 6,000 don't. And it gives us the wrong message and the wrong understanding of how this organism works. And in fact, it's just the opposite. When a gene, when a gene is really needed, it's actually sometimes suppressed. I have no idea why. <laughs> but this whole idea of, uh, uh, it, it, you can get a whole construct that is in fact misinf totally misinformed you understanding. Anyway, I'd like to see um, uh, us try to do something that would bring us together in some technological format. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Our dream, of course, is for the agencies to also collaborate with each other and come to the table and discuss this illness together, too, so that we all are efficient in all of our research uh, from the agency to the researcher to the clinician so that we don't repeat uh, research that we're doing and we share data uh, so that way we can find an answer very quickly. So